Hi, I'm Reed Peterson, and welcome to Grief Refuge. Thanks for listening today and trusting Grief Refuge as a resource to help cope with your loss and navigate your grief. If this is your first time listening, welcome. And if you've listened before, welcome back. Grief Refuge is about providing daily support to help you find peace and purpose after experiencing a death-related loss. This podcast was created with the intention to help validate everything that you're going through, to take time to reflect, and to honor your loved one. Here at Grief Refuge, you will learn healthy ways to manage grief. You can also find comfort, hopefulness, and a sense of peace in regards to your loss, as well as finding a way to embrace life and move forward. Through the stories and conversations shared on this podcast, my intention is to help you work through the heavier, more painful feelings that go hand in hand with grief. Grieving hurts and it's hard to manage. I'm glad you're here and I promise to do everything I can to provide the best support to you. Before we begin, I want to mention a couple important points. Because of the depth and the nature of this topic, it may be more beneficial to not multitask while listening. Rather, I invite you to use this time for your self-care and personal reflection. Please use this time to settle in to relax, and to allow your grief-related feelings to run their course. If anything, please use this time to mourn your loss. Also, this podcast publishes episodes twice a month. And when you're grieving, that's a lot of time in between each episode, and you may need more resources to feel fully supported. So if you're in a place of needing more support right now, download the Grief Refuge app. The Grief Refuge app helps provide comfort and support on a daily basis. On the Grief Refuge app, there are daily mini-podcasts to help validate your grief, to provide tools and perspective for grieving, and to help you sort through the thoughts and feelings that come up when dealing with loss and grief. The Grief Refuge app is easy to find. It's a free download from your phone's app store. Please download it now to get started. Thank you, and let's move on to today's topic. There are people who feel lost and alone because their grief journey is atypical. Today's guest interview with Candace Cahill is filled with her story about relinquishing her son, Michael, and then later grieving the loss of his physical death. Candace shares several examples of what helped her work through her grief so that she no longer felt lost. Part of her process led to the writing and publishing of her new book called Goodbye Again. If you felt like you have lost someone twice, this interview is for you. Candace's story is compelling and it's filled with hope for anyone feeling lost on their own grief journey. Enjoy the interview and the conversation with Candace. Candace, I want to thank you for joining Grief Refuge and I really want to thank you for reaching out to share pieces of your journey and your story it, to me from the very little I know it's very touching and so I'm grateful you're here thank you so much I am so appreciative of the work you're doing the grief refuge app um, these are resources that I wish had been available for me um, when I was first going through and you know in the years following um, I'm nine years out now and uh, and it would have been what you're offering is incredibly valuable. So thank you. Thank you. I'll be honest with you. A lot of people say something about grief refuge, and they say like, "How can you help people when you don't know what my story is?" And that was my biggest challenge when I decided to go forward and create grief refuge app because I was like, the uniqueness of people's experiences is really arguably one of the more important things about their journey. I mean, there's components to being seen and heard and being witnessed and feeling supported and cared for and soothed and, and all of it. But I was like, gosh, there's a truth here where if I don't know their story, am I only telling them from my own experience? So having you on the podcast really helps me gain perspective because I learn more about your experience, which then it obviously adds content to the app because there is the podcast features included. So 
we are being heard on the Grief Refuge app through a podcast episode. But at the same time, like learning your experience is going to help so many people understand their own perspective and gain some of their more insights. So, so with that said, you mentioned things are nine years out. Can you tell us what you're referring to when you, when you say that, Candace? Yeah. Uh, so my son, Michael, uh, passed away at the age of 23 in his sleep. And so, as you can imagine, quite a, a shock um, for myself and my whole family um, and his whole family. And I differentiate and say his whole family because I placed my son for adoption when he was an infant. And the experience of losing him a second time, I thought was going to destroy me. And, you know, what, what eventually transpired was um, I built an incredible relationship with his adoptive family um, that we didn't have before he passed away. Um, but I was so lost. Um, and part of the, the loss was how I never grieved when I placed him for adoption. The, the loss of him as an infant was glossed over both by myself and by my family and by society in general. Uh, there wasn't recognition that it was a loss. Um, and, you know, for, for myself, my coping mechanism back then was just to, to dissociate, to find ways to not feel anything related to it. Um, I, uh, I had been staying at home. I left home. I moved. I, I changed everything about my life um, out of necessity and uh, basically out of a a need to escape, to run away. Um, when he died, I couldn't. Um, and now I was forced to both grieve his death, but I also now had to grieve the, the original loss. Um, and I feel like, you know, nine years, it's taken me <laughs> this long to you know, kind of find uh, my, my way and, and both learning how to be compassionate with myself, learning how to be compassionate with other people um, and giving myself permission in any of those moments when I'm feeling the loss that, that I can do that. So does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I often tell my personal loss story in regards to, um, grieving one person, but also grieving two different types of relationships. And so to hear your experience of grieving the same person in two different experiences, it really put, presses pause on my mind because I haven't heard this before. And it really makes me wanna like take time to slow down and be more careful honestly, about what I ask because of my assumed sensitivity of the experience or both experiences. And then now learning that there was methods to escape after Michael was put up for adoption, but then realizing like, oh, after he physically died, forgive me if the term doesn't resonate, but kind of like there's some catch up grief here too yeah from the time of losing him as an infant um if it's okay to ask do you, is there a moment a memory or anything that first stands out that helped you understand that there was grieving michael his death as an adult but also recognizing there's much to grieve about uh, putting michael up for adoption well, I think most people can relate to kind of a sense of being lost in a fog in the immediate um, time period after 
after the death of someone. For myself, it was a, it was about six months that I f- just was, I, for, for lack of a better term, felt like I was flailing. And, um, and I was searching for things that could help me because I couldn't, I didn't understand why I, first of all, why I couldn't dissociate anymore. <laughs> um, but I, I was just trying to figure out ways to, to cope. And it was coming up on Christmas and I was doing research about, um, you know, how to grieve the loss of a child. And grief experts were say, you know, like I would read things. And, and one of the things that was said was for, for people that have recently lost a child and the holidays are coming up, set a place at your table for that child in remembrance, maybe even put a picture of them in, in that place that was their place, um, cook their favorite foods and, you know, use that as, as a way to, to commemorate and recognize and, and honor that person. Um, another one was buy something that they would have loved and give it to someone else. All of those things I couldn't do because he had never sat at my table. I didn't know what his favorite foods were. I didn't know what he would like as a gift. And it was that moment when I realized that, you know, it, it's what we, what I now understand was disenfranchised grief. I, I, I didn't have a way to connect my here and now with him, whether alive or dead. And, um, and it was, it was really at that point when I was, when I kind of finally realized that it was going to take a lot more work than I even imagined. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I'm with you, Candace. Yeah. And thank you. I, so when in your research and finding ways to cope, um, you know, you shared a beautiful example of cooking a meal and or setting the table. Was there a high percentage of things that you came across in your research that did actually help you cope? Uh, I would say no. My initial response is no. Um, I felt like I really had to search um, and, uh, how do I put it, Um, bring it back to my internal journey. And, you know, so what basically what the things that I kind of uh, latched onto as, as coping mechanisms were meditation which I'd never done before. People had always said, oh, meditation is great. You should, you know, this, it'll help your life, all these things. And, and my, my research had said, you know, if you can meditate for one minute for 10 days, you will feel it in your body. You will feel a change. And I was like, you know what, if all these people are saying it, I'm going to try it because I need to do something. Right. And I did it. And in 10 days, I felt better, not, not, you know, healed or anything like that, but just that tiny marginal bit of a little bit of ease. And it was like, okay. And, and then it became a, um, uh, it reinforced itself. I do it again. No, I, it reinforced. Um, I, I continued to add meditation, do more things and focus on some of those types of techniques because I could see and feel the difference that was happening inside. And, uh, so that was the type of thing that I connected to. Um, I'm trying to think of specific examples of, of tools that worked for me. Oh, so this was, and this was a hard one. Um, I was just trying to find as many ways as I could to just feel better, just to feel physically better. Um, and, uh, so exercise and it was just walking, you know, just a walk, you know, just changing my environment minimally, which has meant go out into nature. I have, I feel wonderful when I'm outside and it doesn't matter that weather or time of day or anything like that. It just feels good. The air is clean. I can hear usually birds, you know, the rustling of the trees, those things were calming. So I knew that if I could just step outside 
when I was feeling these incredible agitations or anxiety, it would usually and almost always did make me feel better. So that was another good one. But probably one of the most significant ones was a lot of the research I found said I needed to learn how to be caring to myself because I wasn't very caring to myself. I had really denied myself, you know, the even just the basics of grieving the loss of my son. So I needed to learn how to be self-compassionate. And it's like, well, how do you learn how to do that, right? And one of the things they said was stand in front of a mirror and look at your, look yourself in the eyes and say, I love you. And I couldn't do it. I immediately, you know, it, it was... It was the hardest, one of the hardest things I'd ever done. And even today, there are times when I try to do this exercise, because I, I still find benefit in it, that I find it hard, that I break down in tears. And, uh, but learning to try to find ways to be more self-compassionate was another very helpful tool um, that I discovered and that has worked for me. Well, I'm deeply grateful for your sharing of these practical tools or experiences that have helped you cope and I assume helped you find hope uh, throughout your journey. They're very helpful to hear because there are many people who have researched, you know, what they can do for their loss and they're probably struggling too to find something that resonates or something that fits. And so voicing something that has helped along the way can inspire others for lack of a better term. But more so than that, Candace, I do wanna say thank you for your honesty. Um, I, I sense that that's a very vulnerable thing to share about looking in the mirror, looking into your own eyes and telling yourself, I love you. And then also having moments where like, hey, this is really hard to do right now. Um, that's, some, that's some deep intimacy. And I just wanna honor that because you're being very honest with your sharing and I'm so appreciative of it. I deeply grateful and get to these moments when I <laughs> interview guests on Grief Refuge podcast where I'm like, you know, let, let's just sit in sacred silence and let's, you know, hold space for this because this is what helps us feel so human. And this is what helps us feel like connected. I don't know what else to call it, but um, on a podcast, sitting there in silence, unless we were meditating all together, probably uh, a little weird. So <laughs> coming back, yeah. you know what, Candace? Um, Thinking about your experience and losing Michael twice and being the losses being very different from one another, is it okay to ask if you could bring us some descriptions of what, what it was like to lose Michael for adoption and what it was like to lose Michael uh, in death? Well... <laughs> That's, it's hard to answer that. And a big part of that is because when I relinquished my rights, I did work really hard to block all that out um, and um, tried to not look at it as a loss. You know, I, try, I tried to listen to the messages that were fairly abundant in society that I should be grateful that he's with a better family. I should be happy that he's with a better family, um, that uh, I was brave, um, which, you know, when I look back at it now, I, I didn't feel brave and I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't necessarily identify with them, but I wanted to. I wanted to believe that it was the right choice. But for me, when he passed away, I think some of the, there were more, there were actually a lot more similarities 
I think when I look back on it now, because when, when he died, I was now suddenly having to realize that we would never get to watch his favorite TV show together. We would never get to go for a hike together. Um, there were so many things that, that I was going to miss out on in the future. And I think, I think everybody who grieves someone can relate to that, that you you grieve for the, what might have been, what made it even harder was that I never had them in the, to begin with. So it, every time I got to a place where I was recognizing where the grief was coming from, it always linked back to the relinquishment that, you know, not only would we never be able to watch Doctor Who together, which was his favorite TV show, we'd never watched a single episode together when he was alive. Um, but I don't know if that makes sense. And I don't even know if that answers your question. Um, when with, with, with Michael, I, I almost always come back to, you know, as I was moving through the grief and moving through the healing, um, I almost always come back to the fact that his adoptive family welcomed me. So they, they welcomed me at the funeral. I was given a place of honor with the family. I was introduced as his mother. Um, I was afforded a, a, a window into their grief and they shared my grief. And since that time, we've developed a beautiful relationship with a foundation of grief and loss, really. Um, and, uh, and I cherish that. Um, and I also look to them as examples of ways to come through it whole. Um, yeah, they have been really instrumental in me helping to find um, the a kind of a sense of acceptance and, you know, the gratitude for what what I did have and what I have access to now because they have all his they have all the memories they have all the pictures they have all the the history and they are willing to share it with me um and so I'm really fortunate with that there's a lot of um, first parents that never get that never have an opportunity to get that so um yeah I feel like I went off on a tangent <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. No, you are right on the mark. I, um, I'm thinking about gratitude and what you said earlier about trying to be grateful. And I got the sense that like you realized it was important, but at the same time, like there were moments where it didn't feel like, Hey, this is a true experience at this time. But yet now when you speak to sharing grief experiences and sharing memories of Michael with his adoptive family. That to me sounds like a, a more authentic sense of gratitude for being able to bond in this way and to share and hold grief with one another. Is that, does that sound like that resonates Candace? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I, I, I feel so fortunate to have that, to have that relationship with them, um, that they're so open and willing to share with me. Um, yeah, you know, when I look at it now, I don't know that I would, certainly wouldn't be as far as I am in what I consider my grief healing journey. I, I don't think I'd be anywhere near where I am now. I, I, I actually, I, I fear I probably would be continue to be lost. Um, and it, but so it was a really key to, to that they were, that they welcomed me in um, and, and referenced me as part of the family. Um, it, it really, really made all the difference for me. And I have a very, I have a very supportive husband who really has always been supportive with um, 
with the relinquishment with, with Michael and, you know, he, when we got together as a couple, it was, Michael was about seven. And one of the first things my husband said, it was mother's day was coming up and he said, well, what do you want? How do you want to celebrate? And I'm like, we don't celebrate mother's day. We don't celebrate his birthday. They're sad. And he's like, no, no, no. You know, you're a mom even if you, even if he's not with you, you're, you're still a mother. So you deserve to celebrate. And, you know, it's his birthday, you know, we should celebrate it. And it totally changed how I felt inside. Um, and th that openness and that willingness um, ha has been with me all the way through. So when Michael died, he was an incredible support system, but it was different than what I could get from um, Michael's adoptive family because they had the history they had all the memories and you know like now when we get together and we try to get together as often as we can it usually ends up being maybe once a year of course covid now we haven't seen each other for a while but you know we get together and and for me they hold all the history but for for them i look just like michael so it's like they have Michael in the room just by looking at me. So we are able to give each other um, comfort in different ways. Hmm. Yeah. That's very touching. Thank you. I'm so appreciative of everything you're sharing. Thinking that at the time of our recording, you mentioned it's been nine years and um, thinking about ways to cope because we both know that I refer to them as Greek bursts, but waves of grief or, you know, getting hit with those moments where like, hey, today's a really hard day, um, despite how much time has passed. What are some of the things that you do to, to cope when those days come? Um, so I finally have gotten better at, I wouldn't say I'm good at it, but I have finally gotten better at, um, you know, recognizing first of all, that it is grief and not something else. I mean, I, I think for a long time, there were things like anger and, you know, that came into play, um, but recognizing that it's grief. And um, for me, um, it's first of all, just letting it, like allowing myself to be sad if I'm feeling sad or even be angry or whatever the feelings are, allowing it first of all. But for me, um, and this is, this is true, now, but it was also true after I relinquished him, is I have a small collection of items that are either, you know, pictures of him, uh, a letter, um, uh, a stuffed animal, um, you know, things like his baby blanket, um, you know, little things that I pull out and I kind of surround me. I create kind of, a, I guess, a little ritual and just allow myself to sit with them. And, uh, and that's very, um, very healing to me because it, it's my way of recognizing that he was here. You know, he's not here anymore, but he was here and uh, he was an important part of my life. Thank you, Candace. That's really touching. So Candace, where in your journey in your process of healing and working through your grief, did the idea of writing a memoir come to mind? When, so, so it, it, I think it's been there for a while. Um, after Michael passed away, um, first of all, you know, it was the, the fog and the grief and all of that. And when I, I came to the realization that you know, a lot of what was going on for me was I was having to grieve both losses. I looked for more specific stories that I could relate to um, about the type of grief that I was dealing with. So, so what I was, where I was finding things were with other first mothers who had relinquished their children. So that was kind of one side of the grief. Another side were parents who had lost their children, generally adult children, because um, it is different, I think, to have adult children versus young children. Um, minor differences, but they do make a difference. Um, 
And, but, but neither one of them really helped me holistically, right? Another avenue that I found help was with um, people experiencing infertility. Um, and it, you know, it again, having to do with kind of ambiguous loss or disenfranchised grief. And so I found all these little pockets, but there wasn't really any one specific place where I could find people really digging into the grief. And I was like, you know what, I need to write about it and try to, because, because it's going to help me. Writing has always been helpful for me. And that was an, another coping mechanism that I didn't mention before, but journaling and just using that as a method to identify what, how I was feeling. Because sometimes I don't even know, but if I write it down, I can find it. Um, but I started writing um, a, 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 pot, or a, a blog and it was about, you know, grief of losing your child in any way. And that just, that went on for probably two and a half, three years where I was writing it fairly frequently. And then I kind of let that kind of soften to the side and I was doing other things and support groups and um, that kind of thing. And it was, um, I think it was in the spring of 2019 and my husband and I were sitting around and we were just talking about kind of the future. Um, and so we were just getting ready to turn 50. And this is kind of a funny story, which is kind of nice to have something <laughs> like here, but we were getting ready to turn 50 and we had just bought life insurance, new life insurance policies, right? So we had existing life insurance policies and then we had the new life insurance policy. So we had doubled up life insurance policies, which ends up being a good sum of money, right? So he turned to me and, you know, we were actually um, on vacation and we were having, I think, a, a fufu drink on the, on the beach. And, and he turns to me and says, so what would you do if I died? He says, it's a lot of money. What are you going to do with all that money? <laughs> and I said, well, after I paid the bills, I, and I thought, I mean, seriously, I thought for maybe 30 seconds, I said, well, I think I would probably buy a little cabin somewhere on a beach, on either a lake or an ocean or, you know, some body of water. And I would write a book. And, and, he, and he turned and he looked at me and says, well, why are you waiting? And, and, and as soon as he said that, I knew that it would be about, you know, the grief journey and the loss of Michael and losing him twice and, and how to, how I got through it. Because for me, a big part of sharing the story, I don't have, I don't have the answers. I don't, I don't know all the tools. What I have is a story that I think most people can relate to. And when I was going through my grief, whether it was the relinquishment, whether it was when he, he and I reunite, reunited when he turned 18, that was a very difficult time when he died. I was looking for people who had stories that I could relate to. That's what I wanted because I, that, those stories helped me feel like I wasn't alone. And I feel like my story, if I put it out there, will help people in lots of different ways to feel less alone. And that's what I wanted to do. This is powerful. And for you listening, if you're getting nudges similar to Candace, definitely ask yourself, what are you waiting for? Um, please yeah. just do it. Candace, what is the name of your memoir? It's titled Goodbye Again. Goodbye so pretty. Goodbye again. Goodbye again. And, uh, and I, the, the title, so it be, when I first started writing it, it was called Lost Again. Because I feel like when I began writing it, I still was lost. I was lost. It wasn't that Michael was lost. It, I was lost. And when I got through the process of writing, which was very cathartic and a and it was, I, I learned so much about myself in the process. Um, I realized that it, 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 I was no longer lost. And it really was about finding a way to say goodbye again to Michael. Hmm. Well, I tell you what, this, sound, this is sounding more and more like a must read because there's, to me, I hear a lot of depth there, a lot of wisdom, and just a lot of, like you said, a story that is now available to help others. So Candace, thank you so much for writing this. Goodbye again. And thank you so much for our conversation on the Grief Refuge podcast. 
you have inspired me. I actually need to go and do some writing. And um, <laughs> I just thank you. This has been a joy. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity um, to share my story. But every time I get the opportunity to tell my story is a way for me to honor Michael. You know, I spent a lot of years denying um, those feelings and, and really denying him. And, and when, you know, it, it, it's like, there's a part of me that, you know, it's too late now, but it's not. And, and I'm going to do everything I can to try to share him and, and honor his life and his role in my life and making me the person that I am. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to the full interview. I'm deeply grateful for your trust in Grief Refuge and all the stories and the experiences shared here on this podcast. Grief and healing is important work, and although painful at times, it's worth it for helping to heal your heart, your mind, and your soul. Remember that if you need more support right now, download the Grief Refuge app. It's a helpful tool that has daily content to comfort and support you through this difficult journey. Please search Grief Refuge on your phone's app store now. Also, please leave a rating and review for this podcast. Your feedback, it's deeply valued, and we listen to it. We want the Grief Refuge podcast to best serve your needs, and the more you let us know, the better we can provide. So please rate and review the Grief Refuge podcast on your favorite podcast player, Thank you, take care, keep honoring your grief, keep listening to your heart, be kind to yourself, and talk to you soon.